Welcome to Disciple Science. I'm Dale Gentry. You know, we spent a lot of time throughout the years trying to figure out how to read this thing well. And you won't be surprised to hear that science has played an important role in that discussion. If you haven't seen our latest video, now is a great time to go watch it. It tells the story of Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and these early scientists and their discovery that the sun is at the center of our solar system, a concept called heliocentrism. Now, if you're familiar with the story, if you've seen this video, you know that this isn't just an account of how we made sense out of the physical characteristics of our world, but it had tremendous implications from our worldview and our understanding of how to approach God's word. Now, this is, unfortunately, this is also a story that gets depicted as one of science versus faith, of scripture versus nature. And in reality, we're going to find that it's much more nuanced than that. Each of these scientists that played a role in it were men of faith, and they were convinced that the discoveries that they made were fully compatible with their understanding of Scripture, uh, but not everybody felt that way. So we're going to spend a week going through the science and making sense out of how this change of framework came to be, and then a later episode going through the implications for our understanding of our uh, approach to scripture and our uh, walk with Jesus. Now, science is something that we have effectively mystified and we convey the idea that it's only for the specially initiated with a lab coat and a PhD and years of training. When in reality, science is something that each of us does almost daily, and the only difference between professional scientists and regular observers of the natural world is just more training and uh, a more rigorous and um, a specific approach. So science works out the principle of inference to the best explanation. Inference to the best explanation can be rephrased as which explanation best makes sense out of our observations of the world. And so when we look at science and the story of the conversion from geocentrism to heliocentrism, what we're essentially asking is, what are the observations that Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler made that convinced them that the best explanation was that the sun was at the center of our solar system and not the earth? Now this story starts about 500 years ago, give or take, when if we were to go out for a walk, so when I come outside, it sure feels like this rock that I'm standing on is perfectly stationary and that that sun is going to move over my head throughout the day. And if I came out at night, we'd get the same with the moon and the stars. So it was common sense that we were stationary and that things were orbiting or moving around us. And it wasn't until some scientists started examining the system that was in place to make sense out of those explanations that we were started to question whether it was the right approach. Now, it's easy to look back in time and snicker at the simple-minded approach that people had. The Earth was at the center of our solar system. But in reality, if it wasn't for telescopes and mathematics and people making detailed observations and trying to put a framework, an explanation for how it all fits together, then I think we would still have the same belief system because what we'll find is that the there were people trying to make sense out of the structure and organization of everything up in the heavens and when they did they found some complexity and confusion that led to the questioning of the systems that they had so we know the simple framework the earth is at the center everything's revolving around it what other insights can we take from how this uh, was actually put together and tried to make sense of through science. Now, the earliest attempt to do this was through a scientist, natural philosopher uh, named Ptolemy. And Ptolemy tried to put a framework that could not only explain how things worked, but try and predict the location of the planets. And as we'll see, science provides great 
uh, confidence in things that can accurately predict what will happen in the future. And so Ptolemy was convinced that the Earth was still and that the moon was a planet and the sun was a planet and that the planets were planets. They had discovered most of the planets, but not all of the planets that we now know are in our solar system and that the stars were stars, okay? So the stars were stars and almost everything else was a planet. The Ptolemaic account of the sun and the moon and the stars was pretty decent, it was acceptable, but what was really problematic were the planets. And part of the reason is that the planets exhibited this odd behavior that we call retrograde motion. And so retrograde motion means that as the planets are moving across the sky, if you track them over time, they suddenly go backwards and then continue back on their regular path. Now that did not make sense according to the assumption that everything was in a circular orbit around the Earth. Why would they go forward and then backward and then forward again? So to account for those odd orbits of the planets, they had to make some adjustments. They added epicycles to the orbits of the planets. An epicycle is, a, again, a weird conception that we can kind of snicker at, but at the time, it sort of accounted for this weird retrograde motion. An epicycle is like an orbit within an orbit. And it allows for the idea that if, depending on where that planet is within its epicycle orbit around the Earth, it could conceivably appear to be going backwards. They also moved the center of the orbit away from the center of the Earth, and they changed the speed of the orbits of some of the different planets. So this explanation was starting to get very, very messy, and astronomers knew that it wasn't a perfect explanation because it couldn't accurately predict the location of the planets, but few of them would conceive of anything as drastic as taking the Earth out of the center of the solar system. But some did. And actually, Copernicus, who gets most of the credit, was not the first to propose this. The idea originated with Aristarchus, and Aristarchus of Samos proposed a sun-centered solar system, and people said, get out of here, you're crazy. What are you thinking? And so the idea didn't go anywhere and it sat on the shelf, but Copernicus was aware of it. And so as he considered all the complexity and problematic approaches of the geocentric view, he decided to explore a heliocentric view. And he tried to put this together mathematically. And so Copernicus's view of heliocentrism uh, made some dramatic changes, many of which will sound familiar to us, but we'll find it wasn't perfect. So he said that we are revolving, of course, around the sun, and that all of the planets are revolving around the sun, and that the Earth is spinning on its axis, and rotating around us is the moon. And he, when he looked at the stars, he said that the stars are just like the sun, but they're further away. That was a crazy idea, but that was their approach, right? So this idea that the, all of the planets were rotating around the sun, but at a different speed, solved that problem of retrograde motion. It explained how the planets might be appearing to go backwards and then continuing forward as we pass those planets in their orbit. But there were some problems. Copernicus was convinced that the orbits had to be circular. This was probably derived from an idea that came from, again, ancient Greek philosophers, Plato and, uh, and Aristotle, and that if there was a perfect god, then that perfect god would make things circular because circles are this perfect structure. So Copernicus assumed the orbits must be circular and that was problematic because what we'll find is that even though Copernicus solved some of the confusing aspects of the geocentric model, the Copernican system wasn't dramatically better at predicting the location of the planets. And remember, if you can't predict what's going to happen, then we don't trust the explanation as thoroughly. And so while it was elegant 
and it solved some of the problems of geocentrism because it didn't accurately predict the location of the planets, a lot of people thought it was just silly. Now, further, this book that Copernicus wrote, it was called On the Revolution of the Heavenly Bodies. It was highly technical. It was really only read by astronomers and therefore it didn't make a big splash in society. People were thinking about how it affected their worldview or their understanding of scripture. In fact, the, the book itself was dedicated to the Pope and it made very little stir within religious communities as well. So Copernicus proposed what we now believe to be true, but it wasn't widely accepted for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it required the rejection of common sense, the simple observations that things appear to be moving over our heads and that we appear to be stationary. And it further rejected Aristotle's physics, which was really the only system they had for understanding the world. Further, it didn't dramatically improve their ability to predict the future locations of the planets. And so we were stuck kind of in the same problem we were before, an imprecise system. The rejection of Copernicanism wasn't about blind adherence to ancient ideas. It wasn't about religious dogma. It was about the hesitancy to leave behind the basic foundations for all that they understood about the world. And remember, it didn't accurately predict the location of the planets. It didn't solve the problems of geocentrism. So geocentrism stood firm. Next in our story is Galileo, who came about 70 or 80 years after Copernicus, and he had a big advantage that Copernicus did not, a telescope. Galileo pointed his telescope at the heavens and he made all kinds of discoveries. He of course pointed it at the moon and he noticed that the moon is cratered and it had mountains and valleys and it was much more like the earth than people expected. And so we saw that the moon is hurtling through the heavens and it kind of resembled all our physical structure and it rejected the idea that the moon would be perfectly spherical and it made more plausible that the earth could also be moving through the heavens. Galileo also studied Venus, and he discovered that Venus goes through phases, and the only explanation for the phases of Venus was that it was circling around the sun and not around the earth. He also studied the stars, and he discovered so many more stars than had initially been seen. He also studied Jupiter, and when he studied Jupiter, he found that it had moons, and this was the first absolute confirmation that there were things that circled objects in the heavens that weren't the earth. These moons were circling Jupiter, not the earth, and it broke again this notion that everything was revolving around the earth. If you watch the video, you know that Galileo got in some hot water, not just for making the discoveries, but the way he talked about what they meant. He was not a very humble person. He talked with great confidence and he had a habit of talking down to and demeaning people that didn't agree with his view and his understanding of the world. Now remember, Galileo wasn't out to prove heliocentrism. He mostly dealt with some of the reasons why people didn't agree with heliocentrism. And we'll discuss in our next episode how Galileo dealt with the, his interactions with the church and what that means for our understanding of scripture. So we now have Copernicus's elegant view of the sun at the center of our solar system, Galileo's dealing with some of the pushback and reasons not to believe the Copernican system, but we still don't have the ability to accurately predict the location of the planets until Johannes Kepler. Now, Kepler uh, followed the work of his mentor, Tycho Brahe, who mostly studied Mars. And in paying close attention to the orbit of Mars for years and years, he was eventually able to come up with principles of the orbit of Mars that we now call laws of planetary motion. 
Kepler recognized that the orbits were elliptical, and when he made his precise measurements and put in elliptical orbits, we eventually came to the ability to make very accurate predictions about the location of the planets, and that ultimately cinched our view of a heliocentric solar system. So despite the appearances of movement over our heads, we now believe that the sun is at the center of our solar system, that we are orbiting around it, and that we are spinning on an axis. Thanks to the outside the box thinking of these early brilliant astronomers, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and Nicholas Copernicus. Now in our next episode, we'll talk about how these scientific observations and conclusions were received by the religious authorities at the time and how they ultimately changed the way we read scripture. Thanks for watching. At Disciple Science, we believe that integrating science with Christian faith can inspire the fullest knowledge of God. We are a nonprofit. We're based here in beautiful, smoky St. Paul, Minnesota, and we are fully crowdfunded. So we're dependent on your generous support to help make all these resources happen. If you want to give, you can do so by visiting our website at DiscipleScience.com.